Hey, y'all. Hey. It's your good sister, Morgan Renee, here to check in with another story time with more of mine. We are finishing up The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Sloot. We're in chapter 24, Lisa Can Do. We're going to hop right into it, but first, if you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel, what are you waiting for? Please go do so. You can type in story time with more of my, spell M-O-R-E-M-Y, and it'll pull up the playlist, and you can check up on all these past readings, past books, future ones to come, and future discussions that I'm going to be having, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's get into it, chapter 24 of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lack, at least they can do. The Lasses didn't know anything about the HELOC contamination problem that led McCusick and her two to them until Michael Rogers, a young reporter from Rolling Stone, showed up at their house with long hair and rock and roll clothes. Rogers was something of a journalism prodigy. By his 19th birthday, he'd gotten a degree in creative writing and physics and published his first story in Esquire. By his early 20s, when he started looking into the HELOC story, he'd already published two books and joined the staff of Rolling Stone. In coming years, he'd go on to be an editor at Newsweek and later the Washington Post. Rogers first learned about Heli sales after seeing Helen Lane live written over a funeral in a medical school bathroom. He started reading news reports about Heli sales and the contamination problem and realized it would make a great story for Rolling Stone, the perfect mix of science and human interest. So Rogers set out to find the mysterious Helen Lane. He called Margaret Guy, who was friendly and talkative until Rogers asked about Helen Lane. Then she told him it wouldn't be a good idea for them to meet and, hang and hung up. Eventually, Rogers found his way to Walter Nelson Reeves, who mentioned as an aside that Henrietta Lacks was the real name of the woman behind the sales. Soon, while sitting on his Baltimore hotel bed with the view of the Brahma Seltzer clock, Rogers found Lawrence Lacks in the phone book. It was the winter of 1975. The streets were icy, and on his way to Lawrence's house, Rogers' taxi was hit by another car in the middle of an intersection. The cab spun in the road doing five and six full circles as if some giant hand had reached down and spun it like a bottle. Rogers had done risky reporting all over the world. Now he was sitting in the back of a cab, gripping the door handle, thinking, damn it, it would be really stupid if I got killed in Baltimore working on this of all assignments. It's not even a dangerous story. Decades later, as I talked with Rogers in his Brooklyn apartment, we agreed, only half joking, that the spinning cab was probably no accident. Deborah would later say that it was Henrietta warning him to leave her family alone because he was about to tell them something upsetting. She'd also say that Henrietta started the infamous Oakland, California fire that later burnt Rogers' home, destroying all the notes and documents he collected about Heli and Henrietta's family. Mm -hmm. When Rogers made it to Lawrence's house, he expected to interview the Lacksuses about Henrietta, but found himself bombarded with questions instead. It was so clear they hadn't been treated well, Rogers told me. They truly had no idea what was going on. They really wanted to understand. But doctors just took blood samples without explaining anything and left the family worrying. Lawrence asked, what I was wondering was about these cells. They say they're stronger, they're taking over. Is that bad or good? Does it mean if we get sick, we'll live longer? Rogers told the Laxers that no, the cells being immortal didn't mean they'd become immortal too, or that they died of cancer, but he wasn't sure they believed him. He explained the concept of cells as best he could, told them about the media reports that had already appeared about Heli, and promised he'd send them copies to read. At this, at that point, no one in Henrietta's immediate family except Deborah seemed particularly upset about Henrietta's story or the existence of those cells. I didn't feel too much about the cells when I first found out they was living, Sonny told me years later. Long as it's helping somebody, that's what I thought. But what changed when he and his brother, but that changed when he and his brothers read Rogers' article and learned this. Cell lines are swapped, traded, forwarded, begged, and borrowed among research institutions around the world. The institutional sources of sales now range from government-supported facilities like Nelson Reed to commercial outfits with toll-free 800 numbers from whom one can order for about $25 a tiny glass vial of Heli sales. With that paragraph, suddenly the Lash brothers became very interested in the story of Heli. They also became convinced that George Guy and John Hopkins had stolen their mother's sales and made millions selling them. But in fact, Guy's history indicates that he wasn't particularly interested in science for profit. In the early 1940s, he turned down a request to create and run the first commercial. Uh, 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 he turned down a request to create and run the first commercial commercial cell culture lab. Patenting the cell lines is standard today, but it was unheard of in the 50s. Regardless, it seems unlikely that Guy would have patented Heli. 
he didn't even patent the roller drum, which is still used today and could have made him a fortune. In the end, Guy made a comfortable salary from Hopkins, but he wasn't wealthy. He and Margaret lived in a modest home that he bought from a friend for a $1 down payment that Ben spent years fixing up and paying off. Margaret ran the Guy Lab for more than a decade without pay. Sometimes she couldn't make their house payments or buy groceries because George had drained their account yet again, buying lab equipment they couldn't afford. Eventually, she made him open a separate checking account for the lab and kept him away from their personal money as much as she could. On their 30th wedding anniversary, George gave Margaret a check for $100 along with a note scribed on the back of an aluminum oxide wrapper. Next 30 years, not as rough. Love, George. Margaret never cashed the check and things never got much better. Whatever, though. Various spokespeople for John Hopkins, including at least one past university president, have issued statements to me and other journalists over the years saying that Hopkins never made a cent off his life sales, that George Guy gave them all away for free. There's no record of Hopkins and Guy accepting money for Heli sales, but many for-profit sale banks and biotech companies have. Microbiological Associates, which later became part of Invitrogen, Invitrogen and Bio Whitaker, two of the largest biotech companies in the world, got its start selling Heli. Since Microbiological Associates was privately owned and sold many other biological products, there's no way to know how much of its revenue came specifically from Heli. The same is true for many other companies. What we know is that today, in Vitrogen sells Heli products that cost anywhere from $100 to nearly $10,000 per vial. A search of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office database turns up more than 17,000 patents involving Heli sales. And there's no way to quantify the professional gain many scientists have achieved with the help of Heli. The American Type Culture Collection, a nonprofit whose funds go mainly toward maintaining and providing peer culture for science, has been selling Heli since the 60s. When this book went to press, their price per vial was $256. The APCC won't reveal how much money it brings in from Heli sales each year, but since Heli is one of the most popular sale lines in the world, that number is surely significant. Lawrence and Sonny knew none of this. All they knew was that Guy had grown their mother's cell at Hopkins, some, someone somewhere was making money off them, and that someone wasn't related to Henrietta Lacks. So, in an attempt to get Hopkins to give them what they saw as their cut of the Heli profits, they made handouts about Henrietta Lacks' family being owed their due and gave them to customers at Lawrence's store. Deborah wanted nothing to do with fighting Hopkins. She was too busy raising her children and trying to teach herself about her mother's cell. She got herself some basic science textbooks, a good dictionary, and a journal she used to copy passage after passage from biology textbooks. Cell is a minute portion of living substance, she wrote. They create and renew all parts of the body, but mostly she wrote diary entries about what was happening. Going on with pain. We should know what's going on with her cells from all of them that have her cells. You might want to ask why so long with the news. Well, it's been out for years, in and out of videos, papers, books, magazines, radio, TV, all over the world. I was in shock. Ask and no one answers me. I was brought up to be quiet, no talking, just listen. I have something to talk about now. Henrietta Lacks, what went out of control. How my mother went through all that pain all by herself with those cold-hearted doctors. Oh, how my father said how they cooked her alive with radiation treatment. What went on in her mind in those short months, not getting better and slipping away from her family. You see, I am trying to relive that day in my mind. Youngest baby in the hospital with TB, oldest daughter in another hospital, and three others at home. And husband got to, you hear me, got to work through it all to make sure he can feed his baby. And wife dying. Her in that cold-looking ward at John Hopkins Hospital, the size of black stone. Oh, yes, I know. When that day came and my mother died, she was robbed of her cells, and John Hopkins Hospital learned of those cells and kept it to themselves and gave them to who they wanted and even changed the name for Heli Cell and kept it from us for 20 plus years. They say donated. No, no, no. Rob Self. My father have not signed any paper. I want them to show me proof. Where are they? The more Deborah struggled to understand her mother's cells, the more Heli research terrified her. When she saw a Newsweek article called People Plan that said scientists had crossed Henrietta cells, Laxer cells with tobacco cells, Deborah thought they created a human plant monster that was half her mother, half tobacco. When she found out scientists had been using Heli cells to study viruses like AIDS and Ebola, Deborah imagined her mother eternally suffering the symptoms of each disease. Bone-crushing pain, bleeding eyes, suffocation, 
and she was horrified by reports of a psychic healer who, while conducting research into whether spiritual healing could cure cancer, attempted to kill Heli Cell by laying on of hands. He wrote, as I held the flask, I concentrated on the picture I formed in my mind of the cells, visualizing the disturbance in the cell fields and the cells blowing up. While I worked, I could feel a virtual tug of war going on between my hands and the cells' powerful adhesive ability. Then I felt the field give way as I had broken through. The cells looked as though someone had put a tiny hand grenade into each one. The whole culture had just blown apart. The number of dead floating cells had increased 20 times. To Deborah, this sounded like a violent assault on her mother, but what bothered her most was the fact that so many scientists and journalists around the world continue to call her mother Helen Lane. Since they've, been, since they've gone ahead and taken her cells, and they've been so important for science, Deborah thought the least they could do was give her credit for it. On March 25, 1976, when Mike Rogers' Rolling Stone article hit newsstands, it was the first time anyone had told the true story of Henrietta Lacks and her family. The first time the mainstream media had reported that the woman behind Heli was black. The timing was explosive. News of the Tuskegee study was still fresh. The Black Panthers had been setting up free clinics for black people in local parks and protesting what they saw as a racist health care system. And the racial story behind Heli was impossible to ignore. Henrietta was a black woman, born of slavery and sharecropping, who fled north for prosperity, only to have her sales used as tools by white scientists without her consent. It was a story of white selling black, of black cultures contaminating white ones with a single cell in an era when a person with one drop of black blood had only recently gained the legal right to marry a white person. It was also the story of sales from an uncredited black woman becoming one of the most important tools in medicine. This was big news. Rogers article caught the attention of several other journalists who contacted the Laxes. In the three months following Rogers' story, Jet, Ebony, Smithsonian, and various newspapers published articles about Henrietta, one of the pivotal figures in the crusade against cancer. Meanwhile, Victor McCusick and Susan Hsu had just published the results of their research in science in a table that took up about two and a that took up about a half of a page under the headings Husband, Child One, Child Two, H. Lax, and Heli. McCusick, Hsu, and several co authors mapped forty three different genetic markers present in DNA from Day and two of the Lax's children and use those to create a map of Henrietta's DNA that scientists could use to help identify HeLa cells and cultures. Today, no scientist would dream of publishing a person's name with any of their genetic information because we know how much can be deduced from DNA, including the risk of developing certain diseases. Publishing personal medical information like this could violate the 1996 Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, CIPLA, and result in fines of up to $250,000 and up to 10 years in jail. It could also violate the 2008 Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act created to protect people from losing their health insurance or employment due to genetic discrimination. But there was no such federal oversight at the time. A lawyer might have told the Laxes they could sue on the grounds of a privacy violation or lack of informed consent, but the Laxes didn't talk to a lawyer. They didn't even know anyone had done research on their DNA, let alone publish it. Deborah was still waiting to hear the results of what she thought was her cancer test, and Sonny and Lawrence were still busy trying to figure out how to get money from Hopkins. They didn't know what was on the other side of the country. A white, they didn't know that on the other side of the country, a white man named John Moore was about to begin fighting the same battle. Unlike the Lack family, he knew who'd done what with his sales and how much money they made. He also had the means to hire a lawyer. All right, that's the end of chapter 24. The next one is 25. Who told you you could sell my fling? Did I keep going? See what time is it? Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, it's kind of short. I'll read it. I'll read 25 real quick. All right, chapter 25. Who told you you could sell my fling? In 1976, the same year Mike Rogers published his article in Rolling Stone and the Lax family found out people were buying and selling Henrietta sales, John Moore was working 12-hour days, seven days a week, as a surveyor on the Alaska pipeline. He thought the job was killing him. His gums bled, his belly swelled, bruises covered his body. It turned out that at the age of 31, Moore had hairy cell leukemia, a rare and deadly cancer that filled his spleen with malignant blood cells until it boils like an overfilled inner tube. Moore's local doctor referred him to David Gold, a prominent cancer researcher at UCLA, who said that removing his spleen was the only way to go. 
More signing consent forms saying the hospital could dispose of any severed tissue or member by cremation and gold removed to sling. A normal sling weighs less than a pound. More weighs 22. Golly. Jesus, boy, let me go back. He thought his job was killing him. His guns bled, his belly swelled, bruises covered his body. It turned out that at the age of 31, Moore had hairy cell leukemia, a rare and deadly cancer that filled his spleen with malignant blood cells. I'm going to have to look up what a spleen is. I don't think I know for sure. Yeah, I got to Google it. I'm not really aware. I need to know more about the body in general. So it said that uh, he told them that they could dispose of any severed tissue or member by cremation and gold removed to spleen. A normal spleen weighs less than a pound. Boards weighed 22. That's wild. How was this dude still living? After the surgery, Moore moved to Seattle, became an oyster salesman, and went on with his life. But every few months, between 1976 and 1983, he flew to Los Angeles for follow-up exams with gold. At first, let's see, what was that, 83, what did he say, 76 to 83? 77, 78, 79, 81, 2, 3, so like 7 years. He was flying to Los Angeles for follow-up exams with gold. At first, Moore didn't think much of the trip, but after years of flying from Seattle to L.A. so Gold could take bone marrow, blood, and semen, he started thinking, can a doctor in Seattle do this? When Moore told Gold he wanted to start doing his follow-ups closer to home, Gold offered to pay for the plane tickets and put him up in style at the Beverly Wilshire. Moore thought that was odd, but he didn't get suspicious until one day, in 1983, seven years after his surgery, when a nurse handed him a new consent form that said, I do or do not voluntarily grant to the University of California all rights I or my heirs may have in any cell line or any other potential product which might be developed from the blood and or bone marrow obtained from me. At first, more circled do. Years later, he told Discover Magazine, you don't want to rock the boat. You may you think maybe this guy will cut you off or you're going to die or something. But more suspected goal wasn't being straight with him. So when the nurse gave him an identical form during his next visit, Moore asked Gold whether any of the follow-up work he was doing had commercial value. According to Moore, Gold said no, but Moore circled do not, just in case. After his appointment, Moore went to his parents' house nearby. When he got there, the phone was ringing. It was Gold, who already called twice since Moore left the hospital. He said Moore must have accidentally circled the wrong option on the consent form and asked him to come back and fix it. I didn't feel comfortable confronting him, Moore told a, told a journalist later. So I said, gee, doctor, I don't know how I would have made that mistake, but I said I couldn't come back. I had to fly to Seattle. Soon, the same form appeared in Moore's mailbox at home with a sticker that said, Circle I Do. He didn't. A few weeks later, he got a letter from Gold telling him to stop being a pain and sign the form. That's when Moore sent the form to a lawyer who found that Gold had devoted much of the seven years since Moore's surgery to developing and marketing a cell line called Mo. Moore told another reporter, it was very dehumanizing to be thought of as Mo, to be referred to as Mo in the medical records. Saw Mo, wait a minute, to be referred to as Mo in the medical records. Saw Mo today. All of a sudden, I was not the person Gold was putting his arm around. I was Mo. I was the cell line, like a piece of meat. Weeks before giving Moore the new consent form, after years of follow-up appointments, Gold had filed for a patent on more cells and several extremely valuable proteins those cells produced. Gold hadn't yet sold the rights to the patent, but according to the lawsuit Moore eventually filed, Gold had entered into agreements with a biotech company that gave him stocks and financing worth more than $3.5 million to commercially develop and scientifically investigate the Mo cell line. At that point, its market value was estimated to be $3 billion. Nothing biological was considered patentable until a few years before Moore's lawsuit in 1980 when the Supreme Court ruled on the case of Ananda Mohan Chakrabarti, a scientist working at General Electric who created a bacterium genetically engineered to consume oil and help clean up oil spills. He filed for a patent, which was denied on the grounds that no living organism could be considered an invention. Chakrabarti's lawyers argued that since normal bacteria don't consume oil, Chakrabarti bacteria weren't naturally occurring. They only existed because he altered them using human ingenuity. Chakrabarti's victory opened up the possibility of patenting other living things, including genetically modified animals and cell lines, which didn't occur naturally outside the body. And patenting cell lines didn't require informing or getting permission from the cell donors. 
scientists are quick to point out that John Moore's cells were exceptional, and few cell lines are actually worth patenting. Excuse me. Patenting. Moore's cells produce rare proteins that pharmaceutical companies could use to treat infections and cancer. They also carried a rare virus called HPLV, a distant cousin of the HIV virus, which researchers hope to use to create a vaccine that could stop the AIDS epidemic. Because of this, drug companies were willing to pay enormous sums to work with their sales. Had Moore known this before Gold patented them, he could have approached the company directly and worked out a deal to sell the sales himself. In the early 1970s, a man named Ted Slavin had done precisely that with antibodies from his blood. Slavin was born a uh, hemophilic in the 1950s when the only available treatment involved infusions of clotting factors from donor blood, which wasn't screened for diseases. Because of that, he'd been exposed to a hepatitis B virus again and again, though he didn't find out until decades later when a blood test showed extremely high concentrations of hepatitis B antibodies in his blood. When the results of that blood test came back, Slavin's doctor, unlike Moore's, told him his body was producing something extremely valuable. Researchers around the world were working to develop a vaccine for hepatitis B, and doing so required a steady supply of antibodies like Slavin's, which pharmaceutical companies were willing to pay large sums for. This was convenient because Slavin needed money. He worked odd jobs waiting tables and doing construction, but he eventually had another hemophilia attack and ended up unemployed again. So Slavin contacted laboratories and pharmaceutical companies to ask if they wanted to buy his antibodies. They said yes in droves. Slavin started selling his serum for as much as ten dollars a milliliter at up to five hundred milliliters per order to anyone who wanted it. But he wasn't just after money, he wanted someone to cure hepatitis B. So he wrote a letter to Nobel Prize winning virologist Barack Bloomberg, who discovered the hepatitis B antigen and created the blood test that found Slavin's antibodies in the first place. Slavin offered Bloomberg unlimited free use of his blood and tissues for his research, which began a year long partnership. With the help of Slavin's serum, Bloomberg eventually uncovered the link between hepatitis B and liver cancer and created the first hepatitis B vaccine, saving millions of lives. Slavin realized he probably wasn't the only patient with valuable blood, so he recruited other similarly endowed people and started a company, Essential Biological, which eventually merged with another larger biological product corporation. Slavin was only the first of many who have since turned their bodies into business, including nearly 2 million Americans who currently sell their blood plasma, many of them on a regular basis. Moore, however, couldn't sell the most sales because that would have violated Gold's patent. So in 1984, Moore sued Gold and UCLA for deceiving him and using his body in research without consent. He also claimed property rights over his tissues and sued Gold for stealing that, them. With that, he became the first person to legally stake a claim for his own tissue and sue for profits and damages. When, Joseph, when Judge Joseph Wapner, most famous for being the judge on the People's Court television show, ended up referring the death positions more figured no one would take the case seriously. Wait a minute. Let me go back. When Judge Joseph Wapner, most famous for being the judge on the People's Court television show, ended up referring the death positions more figured no one would take the case seriously. But scientists worldwide panicked. If tissue samples, including blood cells, became patients' property, researchers taking them without getting consent and property rights up front could risk being charged with theft. The press ran story after story, quoting lawyers and scientists saying that a victory for more would create chaos for researchers and sound the death knell to the university physician scientists. They called it a threat to the sharing of tissues for research purposes and worried that patients would block the progress of science by holding out for excessive prof profits, even with sales that weren't worth millions like more. But plenty of science was already on hold while researchers, universities, and biotech companies sued one another over ownership of various cell lines. Only two of those cases mentioned the people those cells came from. The first, in 1976, involved ownership of an important human fetal cell line. Leonard Hayflick, the researcher who originally grown the cells, argue that there were numerous parties with legitimate property interests in any culture sales, including the scientists who grew them, the finances whose related work, and the donors of the original samples. Without any of those contributions, he said, the culture sales wouldn't exist and neither would any money resulting from their sale. That case set no precedent because it settled out of court with rights to the sales being divided between the parties involved in the lawsuit, which didn't include the sales donor. The same is true for another case soon after in which a young scientist took a cell line he'd helped develop in the United States 
and fled with it to his native Japan, claiming ownership because the original sales had come from his mother. The public didn't realize there was big money in sale lines until news of the Moore case hit and headlines nationwide said things like this, said things like ownership of sales raises sticky issues. Who should have rights to a patient's sales? Who told you you could sell my spleen? Scientists, lawyers, ethicists, and policymakers debated the issues. Some call for legislation that would make it illegal for doctors to take patient sales or commercialize them without consent, and the disclosure of <coughs> excuse me, and the disclosure of potential profits. Others argue that doing so would create a logistical nightmare that would put an end to the medical progress. Ultimately, the judge threw more suit out of court, saying he had no case. Ironically, in his decision, the judge cited the HELA sale line as a precedent for what happened with the Mo sale line. The fact that no one had sued over the growth or ownership of the HELA sale line, he said, illustrated that patients didn't mind when doctors took their sales and turned them into commercial products. Uh, no, no, they didn't know what was going on, so they didn't know the suit. Oh, I'm sure they would. Lord have mercy. So he said, the fact that no one has sued over the growth or ownership of the HELOC sale line, he said, illustrated that patients didn't mind when doctors took their sales and tur turned them into commercial pro products. The judge believed Moore was unusual in his objections, but in fact, he was simply the first to realize there was something potentially objectionable going on. Moore appealed, and in 1988, the California Court of Appeals ruled in his favor, pointing to the Protection of Human Subjects and Medical Experimentation Act a 1978 California statute requiring the research on humans respect the right of individuals to determine what is done to their own body. The judges wrote, a patient must have the ultimate power to control what becomes of his or her tissues. The whole otherwise will open the door to a massive invasion of human privacy and, in, and dignity in the name of medical progress. But gold appealed and won. And with, dang, dang, the doctor that was testing on him without his consent appealed and won. And with each new decision in the suit, headlines flip flop. Court rules sales are the patient's property. Court backs the doctor's right to use patient tissues. Nearly seven years after Moore originally filed suit, the Supreme Court of California ruled against him in what became the definitive statement on this issue. When tissues are removed from your body, with or without your consent, any claim you might have had to owning them vanishes. When you leave tissues in a doctor's office or a lab, you abandon them as waste, and anyone can take your garbage and sell it. Since Moore had abandoned his sales, they were no longer a product of his body, the ruling said. They had been transformed into an invention and were now the product of gold, human ingenuity, and inventive effort. Dang. Moore wasn't awarded any of the profits, but the judge did agree with him on two counts. Lack of informed consent because Gold had disclosed his financial interest and breach of fiduciary duty, meaning Gold had taken advantage of his, of his position as doctor and violated patient trust. The court said researchers should disclose financial interest in patient tissue, though no law required it. It also pointed out the lack of regulation and patient protections in tissue research and called on legislators to remedy the situation, but it said that ruling in Moore's favor might destroy the economic incentives to conduct important medical research and that giving patients property rights in their tissues might hinder research by restricting access to the necessary raw materials, creating a field where every every sales sample a researcher purchases a ticket wait creating a field where with every sales sample a researcher purchases a ticket in a litigation lottery scientists were triumphant even smug the dean of the sanford excuse me the dean of the sanford university school of medicine told a reporter that as long as researchers disclose their financial interests patients shouldn't object excuse me to the use of their tissues if you did, he said, I guess you could sit there with your ruptured appendix and negotiate. Despite the widespread media coverage of the Moore suit, the Lax family had no idea any of this was happening. As the debate over ownership of human tissues played out around the country, the Lax brothers continued to tell anyone who listened that John Hopkins had stolen their mother's sales and owed them millions of dollars. And Deborah started handing out newsletters about her mother and the sales, saying, I want y'all I just want y'all to read what's on this paper and tell everybody. Bring it around. We want everybody in the world to know about my mother. All right, that's the end of that chapter. The book has some pictures of Henrietta. I'm not uh, good y'all can see. This is her and her husband Day, who's actually her cousin. And they had these kids together. Her first daughter was uh Elsie Lax, her eldest daughter. Was about five years old before she was committed to Crownsville State Hospital. They said when she was born, she hit her head on the floor, but they think that's why she never came to. 
and then that's her baby girl Deborah, who never met her mom, or well, obviously she met her because she came out of pooch, but she don't remember her. She died when like when she was a year old or something. Um, yeah, but her older sister was di diagnosed with idiocy. Um, this is the log cabin, the family house that they lived in, and um, let me read it. The home house where Henrietta was raised, the four bedroom log cabin. Henrietta's mother, Liza Pleasant, died when Henrietta was four. Henrietta is buried somewhere in the clearing. Henrietta has an unmarked grave somewhere near her mother. Yeah, so, alright, that's the end of chapter 20. Uh, well, I guess I can show you. Deborah with her children, Latanya, Alfred, and her second husband, James Pulliam. That's a, a baby girl all grown up with her children and second husband. Um... This is Deborah and her cousin Gary. That's Deborah. Deborah at age 13. Alright, so yeah. And then this is the whole family Deborah's children and some of her grandchildren. So, alright, I'll be back with chapter 26 on another day. I appreciate y'all for tuning in. Y'all have a good rest of your day. Peace.